Hello everybody. <clears throat> Welcome to Neat Crash Course Biology. Now in today's synopsis we will be discussing about the chapter called Transport in Plants. Now why plants require transport and what needs to be transported into the plants? Now basically plants need water and mineral nutrients. You know that both water and mineral nutrients are absorbed by the plants from the soil. and then plants need to absorb organic substances organic nutrients also they need to transport organic nutrients for example you know that in the leaves the plants make food in the form of starch and that needs to be transported to different parts of the plant body in the form of sucrose and also various plant hormones that is the plant growth regulators that need to be transported to different parts of the plant how are these substances transported how are how is water transported how are minerals transported how are organic substances transported they are transported in a very simple mechanisms when it comes to small distances say for example a molecule or a solute molecule needs to move from one place to another in the same cell then it would move by diffusion or it would move by continuous cytoplasmic movement that is called cytoplasmic streaming suppose the transport has to happen over a very long distance say for example from the root to the leaf then obviously we have vascular system isn't it xylem is known to carry water over long distances and phloem will carry the food from the leaf to other parts of the plant so basically you must remember the transportation happens in two steps that is in short distances and in lo- longer distances and like it is mentioned here over small distances or over short distances there are processes such as diffusion as well as cytoplasmic streaming and over long distances substances are transported through xylem mostly if you remember water is transported through xylem water and minerals that is in the form of xylem sap and organic substances are transported through phloem like for example if you talk about sucrose so two types of transport are short distance transport and long distance transport now we saw that the transport in xylem just now i mentioned that xylem mostly transports water and minerals unidirectionally that is mostly from the root and the stem because the source of water is the soil and which is the part of the plant which is in direct contact with the soil that is in direct contact with the soil water it is always the root so in xylem the transport always happens from the root upwards so that's why we say it is unidirectional transport in xylem whereas if you talk about organic and mineral nutrients which are transported say for example through phloem then it may happen through bidirectional transport or multidirectional transport for example if you think about the photosynthetic leaves photosynthetic leaves will export their organic substance whatever they made that is starch is exported in the form of sucrose and this sucrose is carried to different parts of the plant and where this sucrose is stored and from the storage organ say for example the food is stored in the root and it is winter season there is no leaf the plant needs food so again from the storage organ again from the root they are re-exported and taken back to those parts of the plant which require the food so through phloem what happens is the transport is not just unidirectional it is multidirectional but in xylem the transport is mostly unidirectional from the root to the aerial parts of the plant mineral nutrients are taken up by the roots very very important in this chapter our main focus is uptake of mineral nutrients and water from the root and it is transported to the stem leaves and other growing parts of the plant body and then you also have certain substances like the plant growth regulator and several other chemical messengers or chemical stimuli like which can be classified as hormones or whose function is not clearly understood till date these are also transported over long distances in the plant body through xylem and phloem okay the first type of transport that you ha- all have to remember it is something that happens over a small distance 
so remember if it is say for example if this is the plant cell if this is a plant cell and this is the vacuole and this is the nucleus of the plant cell and say for example there is a solute particle let me call this as a solute particle if it wants to move from one place to another then it can use a process that is referred to as diffusion since the solute particle is traveling or say for example there is a solute particle outside the cell this is outside the cell and this is inside the cell if it wants to move inside the cell across the cell membrane then it can employ this process that is referred to as diffusion so remember diffusion is something that happens over a short distance and one of the most important attribute of diffusion is it is a completely passive process now i am talking about simple diffusion it is a passive process it does not require energy energy it does not require any living system there is no need of a living system for this diffusion to happen for example you spray a bottle of perfume in one end of your room in no time the perfume or the odor molecules will uniformly spread and you can smell it all over the room so this is diffusion you don't have to have a cellular organization you don't have to have a living system isn't it so what is the flow here in mostly diffusion can happen in solids also it may happen with respect to liquids and it may happen with respect to gases as well so the molecules which are flowing so these are the red dots which are basically the molecules these molecules may be solid molecules or they may be liquid molecules or they may be gaseous molecules where are they flowing from they are flowing from a region of their higher concentration to the region of their lower concentration so this is how the process of diffusion can be defined diffusion is the process where the molecules will move from the region of their higher concentration to the region of their lower concentration and also notice there is no barrier they are freely moving there is no separation between these two zones isn't it now there is no barrier there is no hurdle they are freely moving from the region of their higher concentration to the region of their lower concentration okay so this is how substances can move within the cell or from out to the in or from in to out that is across the cell membrane of the plant cell so remember diffusion is passive it does not require a living system it may happen in solid molecules or liquid or gaseous solute particles generally solid is solute particle okay liquids also can undergo diffusion and diffusion is the most important method for gaseous exchange in the plant body this is the only method by which gases can flow within the plant body for example the gases that are present in the atmosphere they enter the plant body through openings called lenticels and how do they enter that is basically by diffusion so it is the main principle or the main process involved in gaseous exchange uh, in case of plants okay facilitated diffusion now suppose a molecule cannot cross the cell membrane i told you that if you consider this to be the plant cell this is the vacuole of the plant cell this is the cell uh, nucleus if a molecule say a solid molecule a mineral or a solute particle has to enter from outside to the inside this is the outside and this is the inside what if it cannot cross the membrane what if it cannot diffuse on its own across the membrane this mostly happens with respect to molecules which are polar or hydrophilic molecules water loving molecules suppose it is a water loving molecule it cannot enter the cell on its own because the cell membrane is made up of non polar that is fat substances so non polar molecules can readily enter the cell but if the molecule is polar and if the molecule is water loving that is hydrophilic then it cannot enter into the cell on its own so then it requires a special protein that is referred to as this pink colored structure that we refer to as the carrier or the transport protein where is this this is present in the cell membrane so this is the cell membrane of the plant and in the cell membrane of the plant 
we have certain special proteins which are referred to as the carrier or the transport proteins and these carrier or transport proteins see what they're doing they are picking up these molecules these molecules are hitching a ride on these transport proteins they are picking up these molecules they are turning around see how they are turning around and they are depositing the molecules into the cell so the molecule cannot diffuse on its own it needs a carrier or a transport protein which is represented by this pink colored structure which is actually a protein that is embedded in the cell membrane so it picks up the molecules the molecules that need to be transported that need to undergo diffusion and here also notice it is happening from a region of higher concentration that is outside the cell to lower concentration that is inside the cell so what is the transport happening here the transport is happening downhill now why am i using the word downhill downhill means imagine you are walking down the hill that is from a higher level to lower level since the transport here is from a higher concentration to a lower concentration we call this kind of transport as downhill transport now is this active or passive now when the transport is downhill we also use another word it happens along the concentration gradient now whenever anything happens along the concentration gradient there is no requirement of energy there is no need for the expenditure of energy so we call it as a passive transport so facilitated diffusion requires a carrier protein which is lodged in the cell membrane see how it is a very very integral component of the cell membrane this molecule picks up this carrier protein picks up the molecules from outside the cell and puts them inside by rotating by turning around so it picks them up turns around puts them in again turns around again picks them up and puts them in why cannot the molecule on its own go into the cell because the molecule is a polar molecule or a hydrophilic molecule polar or hydrophilic molecules are not soluble in the lipid layer of the plasma membrane so they cannot move on their own they require these transport proteins or carrier proteins in which direction does facilitated diffusion happen it happens downhill downhill means from higher concentration to lower concentration so it is along the concentration gradient when the transport is happening along the concentration gradient is there use of energy no there is no use of energy so basic things you should remember is it happens with the help of carrier transport with the help of Uh, without the use of energy so i'm going to use the word here it is passive okay and it happens downhill downhill means that is from higher concentration to lower concentration another very important thing is it is highly specific every particular molecule has a particular carrier transport or a carrier or a transport protein to which it can bind so this pink molecule here can only bind to the blue molecule it cannot bind to any other molecule that means the binding between the molecule that needs to be transported and the transport protein or the carrier protein is highly specific and then it has the ability to attain saturation what do you mean by saturation now all these transport proteins imagine if all of them in the cell membrane are occupied by the solute particles if all of them are occupied then for some time there is no transport because there is no free carrier transport available say for example the carrier transport is like chairs and the molecules are like people if there are 10 chairs and if all the 10 people are sitting on 10 chairs then there is nobody else who can sit because all the chairs have become filled similarly if there are 10 molecules and there are 10 transport proteins if all of them are filled we say that it has attained a level of saturation sometimes they can also exhibit inhibition they can get inhibited as in if some molecule say a toxin or a drug comes and binds to them say here i'm showing it comes and sits on them then it will not allow the transport protein it will have a negative influence 
on the transport protein it will arrest the functioning of the transport protein so we say that it exhibits inhibition okay so these are the features of facilitated diffusion it's passive it exhibits downhill transport it is highly specific if all of them are occupied it can undergo saturation temporarily and it is capable of being bound to by inhibitors which inhibit the activity of the carrier transport there are different types of carrier transport or facilitated transport depending upon the direction of the molecule movement now say for example there is a carrier protein this carrier protein is allowing movement of only one molecule in one direction we call it as uniport now this is allowing the movement of one molecule in one direction coupled with another molecule in the opposite direction if two molecules are being transported in opposite directions together simultaneously we would call this carrier protein as antiport if two molecules are being transported in the same direction simultaneously we call such a carrier transport mechanism as symport now all these are passive because i told you usually the transport happens uh, from higher concentration to lower concentration so remember there it happens along concentration gradients and whenever it happens along the concentration gradient we say that the transport is from higher concentration to lower concentration that is it is happening downhill so sometimes other, other than carrier protein say for example this is a plasma membrane there may be channel proteins that are formed there may be proteins which enclose a channel like a gate to allow the movement of substances say for example this is inside the cell this is outside the cell and these are the molecules which are being pass through these channel proteins now these channels may again be passive or they may be they may use energy but if usually they are passing from higher concentration to lower concentration there is no energy required okay now such proteins are referred to as the channel proteins the best example for channel proteins are protein channels which allow water to flow through they are referred to as the aquaporins aquaporins are present in the outer membrane of mitochondria outer membrane of plastids like chloroplast and also the bacterial membrane these are channels remember these are gates which are made up of see what i'm shading here is a protein molecule these are gates made up of protein they enclose channels through which molecules can pass again the molecules are passing from their higher concentration say outside the cell to their lower concentration since the transport is happening from higher concentration to lower concentration obviously the channel protein also involves the transport that is happening passively or downhill so if this is the membrane i have shown you how a channel protein is sitting so this is the plasma membrane of the plant cell for example so in the plasma membrane of the plant cell you have these channel proteins which will create a hydrophilic channel for substances to pass through them the best example is the aquaporin like i said remember the location of aquaporin that is they are located in outer membrane of mitochondria outer membrane of plastids and sometimes even in bacterial membranes also okay so these are referred to as the channel proteins the best example for channel protein is the protein channel that allows the flow of water which is called the aquaporin so remember on what basis have we classified the transport mechanisms into uniport antiport and symport on the basis of whether this channel protein this carrier protein sorry this is not a channel protein it's a carrier protein like how i showed you in the previous slide it picks up a molecule it rotates it turns and deposits in it inside the cell if it is transporting only one molecule at a time it is uniport two molecules simultaneously in opposite direction antiport two molecules simultaneously in the same direction symport okay so these are types of facilitated diffusion what about active transport in active transport also we have a protein that is lodged in the membrane we can call it as the carrier protein 
Now sometimes these proteins which take part in active transport are referred to as the pump proteins. So what these proteins do is, now see here this is outside the cell for example and this is inside the cell and this is the cell membrane. Now notice that here the concentration is less and here the solute concentration is very high. So from where is uh, from where to where is the transport of this green colored cubes. Now these are the solute particles or these are the molecules which are being say for example solute or any molecule that is being transported okay now remember here they have not shown any cubes because here the concentration is lower that means the transport is happening from lower concentration to higher concentration so whenever the concentration is reversed that is the transport in passive diffusion and in facilitated diffusion if you remember the transport was happening from higher concentration to lower concentration. Here in active transport, it is happening from lower concentration to higher concentration. That's the reason why ATP is required. It takes a lot of energy to transport any molecule or a solute from its lower concentration to its higher concentration. Since there is use of ATP, there is energy consumption. This process is referred to as the active transport so let us write down the features of active transport is it passive no it is active because it uses energy now where is the con uh, uh, transport happening the transport is happening from lower concentration to higher concentration when we say that transport is happening from lower concentration to higher concentration it's as if you are climbing up the mountain from the base of the mountain to the highest peak of the mountain so we say it is uphill transport very easy imagine you are climbing a mountain you are undertaking a trek you obviously need energy so therefore energy or ATP is consumed so it requires energy or ATP so therefore we say energy or ATP is consumed. Why is energy consumed? Because the transport is happening from lower concentration of the molecule or the solute to higher concentration of the molecule or the solute. Again, this carrier protein is highly specific. It will not go and bind to any and every molecule. For every specific molecule or for every specific solute particle, there will be a specific carrier protein which is present in the plasma membrane again this can be or it may be inhibited that means if there is a drug or a chemical which comes and binds to this carrier protein the carrier protein say for example it comes and binds here i am putting a minus sign because it is inhibitor it will block the functioning of the active transport even in the case of uh, active transport yes if all the active transport carrier proteins are saturated then for temporarily there will be no active transport if it's all filled up like i told you if there are 10 people and 10 chairs if all the 10 chairs are filled up no more people can sit down similarly if all the carrier proteins are saturated then temporarily the process of active transport will stop okay so here you can see The comparison between sim nothing is applicable to simple diffusion because simple diffusion is happening irrespective of the living system. I told you even in a room it can happen when you spray a perfume bottle or even in a beaker it can happen when you put a crystal of KMnO4 in water in minutes the purple the entire liquid water will turn into purple or pinkish purple in color. Whereas we saw that there is requirement of special membrane protein for both facilitated and active transport. Both are highly selective. Any transport cannot bind to any, any transport protein. Uh, a transport protein or a carrier transport uh, will not go and bind to any molecule. There is a specific carrier protein for a specific molecule. After a point, transport saturates. Like I told you, if all the carrier proteins are occupied by the, uh, by the molecules that need to hitch a ride on them, then there is no free space available. Like if all the chairs are occupied by people, there is no free chair available temporarily. Till they get transported to the other side of the cell, there are no free carrier transports. So we say that they attain saturation. 
uphill transpiration is no and no for facilitated because facilitated and simple diffusion they happen from higher concentration to lower concentration so for both of them it is downhill transportation only for active transport it is uphill transportation that is from lower concentration to higher concentration and only active transport requires energy why does it require energy because like i told you the transport is uphill okay now moving to the concept of water potential <clears throat> Now notice this U, uh, the bent tube over here, the U-shaped tube. Okay. Now in this tube, you can see on one side they have taken pure water. On one side they have taken. Let me label this as the solution, because it has water in it. Because it has a solute molecule in it. The solute may be salt or sugar or any molecule for that molecule uh, for that matter. So you have taken pure water in one limb of this tube and you have taken salt water or solution in the other limb of this tube and you have separated the two by semi permeable membrane. Notice in which direction is the water moving. The water is moving from the dilute solution to concentrated solution. Do you do agree that pure water means there is absolutely no solute in it? If there is no solute in it, it is absolutely dilute but in this solution there is a solute so we say we use the word concentrated for this particular solution okay now if you take pure water in pure water all the water molecules are very very free why are they free because they don't have a solute to interact with them so they have lot of free energy they have lot of kinetic energy they keep frolicking around they keep bumping into each other very happily so we say that they have a lot of kinetic energy and therefore in pure water all the water molecules are in a very very high energy state that is they have a lot of kinetic energy so we call this free energy or the kinetic energy of the water as the water potential so please remember water potential is denoted by psi w and the water potential of pure solvent like pure water is the highest water potential so why in pure water the water potential is very high because like i told you in pure water all the water molecules are very very free they are roaming around they are bumping into each other that means they have the highest kinetic energy and this highest kinetic energy is referred to as the chemical potential of water is referred to as water potential now why in the solute the water potential is low because here let me represent again the water molecules in uh, hollow circles like this these are the water molecules now i will show the solute in solid circles okay so solute is there so every water molecule is busy interacting with the solute they are not free because they are constantly interacting with the solute so when they are constantly interacting with their solute what happens they are not freely bumping into each other so we say that the kinetic energy of the water molecule is falling it is less so we say that the water has a less water potential psi w is the abbreviation for is the symbol for water potential is that clear so in pure water the water molecules are very free they have high water potential lot of kinetic energy in solution the pure water molecules are very very busy interacting with the solute particle they are not free they are very very busy in this case and as a result because they are busy in this case we say that their kinetic energy is low and there is less water potential so always remember water flows from higher water potential psi w to lower water potential so this is what is referred to as the osmosis of water why do we say osmosis because it is happening across a semi permeable membrane which is considered to be a barrier for transport because i told you diffusion does not involve any barrier this flow of water across a semi permeable membrane is referred to as osmosis and in which direction does osmosis happen osmosis takes place from higher water potential to 
lower water potential is it clear so osmosis always happens from higher water potential to what lower water potential now you have all have understood the concept of water potential that it is the measure of the total free energy kinetic energy of water it is the measure of the chemical potential of water molecules and if there is only water they have highest water potential if there is solute then the water is busy with the solute so its kinetic energy falls and therefore we say that the water potential has also decreased okay so we saw that for water potential you represent it by psi w and it is usually having a unit of pascal it is measured in pascals okay and a very important thing is i told you that pure water pure water has the highest water potential because i told you in pure water there is only water there are no solutes they are free to move around they are constantly bombarding with each other there are lot of kinetic energy so we say that there is a very high water potential in pure water and now you also understood that water always flows from higher water potential to lower water potential and one more thing i told you was when you have pure water say water with solute in it i told you that whenever solute is there in the water then the water molecules are now interacting with the solute particle and as a result the overall free energy of the water molecule will decrease and as a result the water potential of the water will also decrease so this is one thing you should remember then by convention please remember the value of the maximum water potential is zero so if you say what is the water potential of pure water it is zero okay then the remaining values are all on the negative scale it is if water potential decreases it cannot go beyond zero because zero is considered to be the highest possible water potential i told you absolutely pure water will have a water potential of 0 it cannot go beyond that if i say low water potential it should be less than 0 so if there is a low or a fall in water potential then it should be less than 0 when everything goes less than 0 we say that it has a negative value so remember we should move on the negative scale as we talk about lower water potential so if i say that pure water that is the highest water potential it may have a water potential of 0 and so if i consider this to be pure water then the value of this pure water will be 0 and if i consider this solution which has low water potential it will have a value in a negative scale say for example minus x or say y x let us say minus 5 for example so remember that as you keep adding solute into the water what are you doing to the water potential you are bringing down the water potential in which scale are you bringing down the water potential in the negative scale so highest water potential is zero low water potential when you add solute it becomes less than zero okay there is an equation for water potential water potential is equal to psi s plus psi p now what is psi s psi s is called solute potential or it is also referred to as osmotic potential and psi p is called pressure potential so remember this equation all of you psi w is equal to psi s plus psi p now let us look into psi s i told you psi s is solute potential or osmotic potential so imagine that i have a beaker with me with absolutely pure water in it 
so i am going to represent water by these hollow bubbles as i have been doing now imagine i am adding so in this what is the water potential the water potential is zero the highest possible water potential that is the maximum water potential is zero now imagine i am going to add solute to this so when i add solute to this what am i going to do to the water potential now you have a beaker in which there is not just free water but along with the water what is there in between solute particles are there okay so now the water molecules have become very very busy the water molecules are interacting with i'm sorry with the stylus so these hollow bubbles are the water molecules the water molecules are now interacting with the solute so what do you think will happen to the water potential the water potential falls because you have added what solute to it now the degree by which or the magnitude of fall how much the uh, water potential falls is referred to as sol solute potential so magnitude of fall in water potential and it is nothing but a direct consequence of concentration of the solute the more solute you add the more fall in the water potential the less solute you add the less fall in the water potential so by how much it falls that fall in the water potential is referred to as the solute potential say for example from 0 the fall has happened now the water potential is minus 5 under normal pressure what happens under normal pressure is water potential that is w psi w is equal to solute potential so water potential is also minus 5 because you added solute and by how much has it come down from 0 it has come down by minus 5 so water potential is equal to solute potential at what pressure at normal atmospheric pressure both have the same value the same sign when there is no extra pressure acting on the liquid so remember the maximum water potential was zero and now it has come down why did the water potential come down because you added what what are these solid bubbles these are the solute particles now when you added solute to it what happens basically is there is a fall in water potential say for example what was zero before has now become minus 5 how much is the fall from zero it is minus 5 the degree of fall the magnitude of fall which is minus 5 is referred to as the solute potential why do we use a minus sign for solute potential we always use a negative sign because it brings down the water potential <clears throat> does adding a solute increase the water potential it doesn't increase the water potential adding a solute will bring down the water potential and that's why the solute potential will always have a negative value suppose you are exerting a pressure then something else comes into picture say for example uh, you take the equation that is psi s is equal to psi sorry psi w water potential is equal to not just solute potential when there is an external pressure you have to take into account the pressure as well because this pressure that is when it is applied to a solution this is the pressure that is greater than the normal pressure that is existing around us that is the at atmospheric pressure when there is a more pressure we say that it contributes to higher water potential that means it increases the water potential that's why we are giving what sign over here we are giving a plus sign to the pressure potential so remember when you are applying pressure external pressure to the solution even though it has solute in it its water potential will increase so this pressure that you apply that is greater than the atmospheric pressure please remember it has a positive sign because it increases the water potential and why does the solute potential have a negative sign minus psi s plus psi p it is having a negative sign because it brings down the water potential at atmospheric pressure what is equal to what water potential and solute potential or osmotic potential are the same like i told you it was zero now it has come down on the negative scale to minus 5 by how much has it come down from zero 
the degree to which it has come down is 5 units and you assign a minus sign to this it becomes minus 5 both are equal because what is not playing a role here pressure is not included over here so the equation you have to remember is psi w is equal to psi s plus psi p in when psi p is not acting psi w is equal to psi s when a greater pressure is applied you need to take into account the psi p also which is the atmospheric pressure sorry which is the pressure greater than the atmospheric pressure osmosis we just discussed that in osmosis are we talking about movement of solid or gas no we are exclusively talking about movement of water molecules now tell me in what direction does a water molecule move during osmosis during osmosis the water molecule moves from the region of its higher water potential to the region of its lower water potential so we are talking in terms of not concentration we are talking about in terms of water potential so water moves from the region of its higher water potential to the region of its lower poten water potential you have taken a funnel you have inverted the funnel and you have covered the mouth of the funnel with a membrane say egg membrane or cellophane membrane which acts as a semi permeable membrane inside the funnel you have taken a sucrose solution remember it is a solution so water potential is less but in the beaker you have taken pure water now when you take pure water in the beaker what is the water potential the water potential is the highest possible so from where will where from where to where will the water flow now the water will flow from the beaker into the thistle funnel so see the movement of water here they have shown arrows water is moving into the thistle funnel what determines how quickly the water or how greatly the water is flowing in the concentration of the sucrose solution okay now you have to apply imagine from the stem of the thistle funnel you are applying pressure using a piston now the pressure the correct pressure at which the flow stops see no more flow of water is happening why water is not flowing because you are applying pressure from the opposite side so when you apply a pressure and what has stopped because of this pressure osmosis has stopped the pressure which is required to stop the process of osmosis is referred to as osmotic pressure so don't you think if this sucrose solution the sucrose solution that you have taken if it has a higher concentration or if you have a lower concentration when do you think you have to apply a greater pressure to stop the entry of water molecules into the thistle funnel obviously if the concentration of the sugar solution is very high then the pressure required to stop the entry of water is also high if the concentration is low then the pressure acqui pressure required is also low so don't you think that the osmotic pressure is directly related to the osmotic or the solute concentration of the particular sample of solution so higher the concentration higher the pressure you have to apply lesser the concentration lesser the pressure that you have to apply and when you apply the pressure onto this liquid column what are you stopping you are stopping the entry of it stops the entry or osmosis of water molecules this pressure that is required to stop the entry of os the entry of water molecule or the osmosis is referred to as the osmotic pressure so like i said the osmotic pressure is a direct concentration of the osmotic potential one more thing i wanted to tell you i told you that the degree by which the water potential falls is called the solute potential solute potential is also referred to as the osmotic potential an osmotic potential or solute potential is a direct consequence of the solute concentration isn't it and the value of osmotic potential and osmotic pressure is the same why because if the osmotic potential is higher higher means if it is 
sorry if the osmotic potential is very very low as in if it is more negative when does the solute potential become more negative when there is too much solute in it when there is too much solute in it when the osmotic potential is very very low the osmotic pressure is very very you require a greater pressure in order to stop the water from entering inside okay so basically osmotic potential and osmotic pressure are both related to one another so when i say i'm repeating again low osmotic potential low osmotic potential means remember solute potential or osmotic potential is always on the negative scale so low means it is more negative so low osmotic potential means you require a very high osmotic pressure to stop the entry of water molecules okay so say for example uh, but only thing is the sign is different pressure is something that you need to apply so it has a positive sign but if it is more negative obviously the potential will be negative the value will be the same how much ever negative it is the same magnitude you have to apply the pressure so the value is the same but potential is negative pressure is positive that is you are applying it from an external source so pressure will be positive but potential is something which is on the negative scale so please remember solute potential is also referred to as the osmotic potential and i'm repeating over here if a solution has low osmotic potential that means it is more negative it will require that much amount of pressure it will require for you to apply that much amount of pressure to prevent the entry of water molecules into that solution so lower the osmotic potential greater the pressure that needs to be acquired magnitude wise strength wise the value is the same but sign wise osmotic potential is negative osmotic pressure is positive whenever a pressure is applied it is a positive pressure because you are applying a pressure greater than the atmospheric pressure because the pressure is greater than the atmospheric pressure we say that it is a kind of a positive pressure is it clear to all of you solution types hypotonic solution now this is inside the cell and this is outside the cell the blue one represents the solution and the brown one represents the cytoplasm let us call it cell sap the cell sap may either be cytoplasm or it may be the vacuole fluid which is called the vacuole sap and the green circles represent solute like salt or sugar or mineral okay now see why is this solution called hypotonic solution because it has less solute concentration compared to the cell sap so because it is dilute in comparison to the cell sap okay remember we are always going to compare it with the cell sap which is the cytoplasm and the vacuole so if in comparison to the cell sap there is less solute in it it is dilute then we call it as hypotonic if the solute concentration in the outside solution and the solute concentration in the cell sap is the same then we call it as isotonic if the solute concentration in the outside solution is very very high in comparison to the cell sap then we call it as a concentrated solution or a hypertonic solution critical pressure i already told you the pressure required to prevent the entry of water and i also told you that osmotic pressure is related to osmotic potential which is nothing but the solute potential that is psi s both of them have the same value but both of them signs are opposite that means the lesser the solute potential that is the lesser means more negative say for example if it is whenever i say less it is more negative when i say more it is moving towards zero okay so if it is lesser the solute potential you have to apply greater the pressure that is the osmotic pressure is applied at the same strength however negative it is the same strength or the same amount of pressure needs to be applied but this has a negative sign and this has a positive sign turga pressure when cell water is continuously entering into the cell now if this is the cell membrane you know that a plant cell has a cell wall now this is the cell membrane 
and this is the nucleus and this is the vacuole for example and imagine that water is continuously moving in through endosmosis the inward flow of water from the surrounding medium into the cell is called as endosmosis so the cell membrane the cell will start bloating up because it will start swelling because water is entering into the cell and now you can imagine that the cell membrane will start exerting a pressure on the cell wall this pressure is referred to as the turgor pressure and now because the cell cell membrane is exerting a pressure on the cell wall the cell wall will also exert an equal and opposite pressure on the cell membrane and this equal and opposite pressure exerted by the cell wall is referred to as the wall pressure so the pressure exerted by the cell membrane on the cell wall is turgor pressure by the cell wall on the cell membrane in return is the wall pressure now when does a cell undergo plasmolysis in plasmolysis see how the cell is shrinking this is the cell membrane the cell membrane is getting withdrawn from the cell wall it shrinks from the cell wall that happens when you place the cell in a hypertonic solution so the surrounding solution in which you have kept the cell has a very high solute concentration so when a solution has higher solute concentration in comparison to its cell sap that is inside the cell it is called a hypertonic solution see how the cell has completely shrunk into a mass over here it has lost most of its water to the surrounding because the surrounding solution is hypertonic now when the surrounding solution is hypertonic water always flows from hypotonic to hypertonic solution so water exits the cell and the cell shrinks and this is referred to as plasmolysis now you think and tell me if you want this cell to be brought back to normal then we call this process as deplasmolysis if you want to bring this cell back to normal then when you carry out this process what will you do you will place this cell in a hypotonic solution isn't it so that water enters the cell back so remember if you want to shrink the cell it should be placed in a hypertonic solution if you want to bring the cell back to its normal state it should be placed in a hypotonic solution imbibition is a process where uh, certain solids or colloids have the ability to absorb water now see you have placed seeds inside the water and uh, in no time the seeds have swollen up like this so the seed which has very little water again imbibition happens from higher water potential to lower water potential that is the flow of water happens from higher water potential to lower so higher water potential is the water and the lower water potential is the seed because seed has very little water in it so water flows from outside environment into the seed and therefore the seed is swollen up and another thing is the seed must have affinity towards water it must have some uh, likelihood of holding water it should hold on to water so it should have as affinity towards water and this is what is the process of imbibition it is seen in solid colloids which have a tendency of absorbing water they have tendency of absorbing water because they have a greater affinity they like water they have an affinity towards water and here also the water movement requires a gradients in water potential water flows from higher water potential to lower water potential water is involved in almost all physiological activities all substances are dissolved in water and the protoplasm of the cell itself is entirely made up of water now after we discuss about the water relations we had told about short distance and long distance transport this long distance transport whichever long distance transport is usually used uh, referred to by a term that is referred to as translocation it may be translocation of water that is happening through the xylem tissue or it may be translocation of food that is happening through the phloem tissue clear how do you know that water is translocated through xylem for that you can conduct a very simple experiment place a, a freshly cut twig of balsam plant the cut portion of it is immersed in a liquid containing a red dye and leave it aside for about a few hours and then you take a section of 
the stem and when you take a section of the stem you can only see the xylem tissue that is colored red indicating that the water or the ascent of sap is mostly happening only through xylem. And generally when we say there is a short distance I told you we cannot use diffusion or active transport for short distance. We need to use certain mechanisms that we will be discussing for long distance transport. Long distance transport like I told you long distance transport of water happens in xylem and in uh, food happens in the case of phloem. We call this long distance transport also as mass or a bulk flow system. It's like say for example there is a river flowing and you put a paper boat in it. The boat gets passively carried by the water current in the river. The boat is not moving by its own virtue. Whereas diffusion and water potential is all movement by its own virtue. But here the water carries that paper boat with itself. That is referred to as mass or bulk flow that is long distance transport happens is as a mass or a bulk flow many many solute particles are carried by the flowing water like how uh, twigs and debris may, may get carried by the river water that is flowing okay and this movement that is water carrying with it substances in the form of a bulk flow or a mass flow is referred to as translocation how do plants absorb water? Plants absorb water from their root because root is in direct contact with the, with the soil water. And then in the root you have learnt the anatomy of root. Basically there is epidermis, there is cortex, then there is a steel which has the xylem and the phloem and then the endodermis is the innermost layer of the cortex and notice the two parts in which the water is flowing. The water is passing through only the cell wall. The cell wall is completely permeable to water and this is referred to as apoplast. If the water flows through the cytoplasm and the cytoplasmic connections called plasmodesmata that exist between the cells of the root then it is referred to as symplast. Majority of the water transport happens by apoplast. But why after endodermis it is always symplast? Because the outer cell wall of the endodermis is sealed off by a strip of waxy coating called suberin and this is called the Casparian strip. So water cannot cross the Casparian strip. So water takes a detour, it enters into the cell and then it takes symport as its transporting mechanism. So up to the endodermis it is both symplast and apoplast but after the endodermis it is mostly the symplast. Why it changes into symplast at the endodermis? Because the endodermal cell wall in the outer lining of the endodermis there is a thick layer of suberin which is called the Casparian strip which completely is impenetrable or impermeable. So therefore the water enters the cell and from the endodermis onwards into the xylem see it enters the cell layer called pericycle and from there it enters into the xylem through symplast although majority of the water absorption is through apoplast because there are a lot of spaces between the cells intercellular spaces and they have lot of cell wall material also which is freely permeable to water so contribution is mostly by apoplast but after endodermis at endodermis onwards it is only symplast See how the water is moving. Initially it is symplastic. No, from the beginning it is symplastic pathway. The red line is symplastic pathway. And this is the root hair which is the projection of the epidermal hair. It is a unicellular projection. And notice how the water is passing through the living parts of the cell. That is through the cytoplasm and the plasmodesmata. All the way into the xylem tissue. But here the blue line stops abruptly over here. Why? Because the blue line represents the flow of water not through the cytoplasm but through the non-living components of the cell that is the cell wall and the intercellular spaces and why it is stopping abruptly in the endodermis because I told you in the endodermis the cell wall layer is thickened by suberin thickenings which will not allow the water to flow so from endodermis the water has to enter into the cell and carry out the symplastic path. Water movement up the plant the best example to demonstrate how the water movement is happening up the plant. Now firstly it can be demonstrated by using a mechanism 
that is uh, which is used by certain plants but it doesn't sh push the water up to a great extent it is called root pressure it is the pressure built up in the root now in the previous slide i told you water keeps collecting isn't it water is coming in from all sides so when the water keeps coming in what happens to the pressure of the water here the pressure of the water will increase and that will pump the water up the plant body it's like when you connect a pipe to the tap and you turn the tap on how does the water start gushing in because at the mouth of the tap the pressure is the highest isn't it so this is like the mouth of the tap why is the pressure the highest in the root because more and more water is being funneled into the xylem through the symplastic and the apoplast pathway so the pressure in the xylem in the root increases and that starts pushing water up so the water that is getting pushed up is because of the pressure that builds up in the xylem of the root tissue and this is referred to as the root pressure root pressure can best be demonstrated where you take a stem a well watered plant during the early morning or in the night time you make a section just above the ground level okay and then immediately you connect it with a rubber sleeve into an apparatus which contains manometer that is a mercury level you will see that the mercury level will keep rising because from the cut part water starts sap starts oozing out now when sap starts oozing out say for example this is the cut part of the stem that is just above the ground level when you cut you will see that a sap starts oozing out now what does this mean that a sap is oozing out from here that means there is high pressure in the root and there is low pressure here because you have cut it and therefore the liquid from the xylem will start oozing out from the root there is exudation from the cut part and how do you prove that exudation by connecting this with a rubber sleeve and a manometer because there is exudation happening the water column will rise up in this tube and that will exert a push on the mercury column and the mercury column will also rise up so this is something which helps you demonstrate root pressure another best way to demonstrate root pressure is to observe a phenomenon that is seen in plants which is referred to as the guttation where water bubbles that is liquid water keeps getting exuded from the ends of the plant like in the margins of the leaf and the tip of the stem through special aperture there will be an opening at the margin which is referred to as the water stomata or the hydathode and why water is being exuded like this because there is very high pressure in the root that is the xylem of the root because water is continuously entering into the xylem of the root and therefore the pressure builds up over there and water gets pushed up and that water is exuded through the hydathode in the form of liquid droplets okay now moving on to transpiration pull how exactly the transpiration happens see you know that transpiration is a phenomenon where the water is lost in the form of water vapor it mostly happens in the leaf tissue here they have taken a section of the leaf tissue see this tube this tube is the xylem the xylem has reached all the way into the leaf tissue from what from the root system isn't it and it is carrying water in it all the water molecules are attached to one another by a uh, by a, a force which is called cohesion and then in the leaf you can see how the water is getting pulled out of the xylem tissue and it is entering this chamber this chamber is called the stomatal chamber in which the water evaporates to the outside the opening is called as the stoma this evaporation of water through the special openings which are referred to as the stomata is referred to as uh, the transpiration process and now what happens because water is evaporating the water molecule get pulled up the xylem and see how the water is flowing up the xylem in the form of a continuous chain an unbreakable column of water is flowing up and that column extends all the way down the pull is extended all the way down from the root and through the root the water gets absorbed automatically because there is a continuous column of water that is formed and when water molecules which form a continuous if this is the water molecules there is a force of attraction between them which makes sure that the water molecules move in a single line like a continuous force of attraction and this force of attraction between like molecules is called cohesion 
and where is this moving this is moving in the xylem so there is some attraction between the water molecule and the wall of the xylem this kind of an attraction between the water and the polar surfaces like the wall of the tracheids or the element is referred to as the adhesion that's why water flows in the form of a continuous column so this imagine to be the xylem here okay so this is what happens water flows as a continuous column and imagine pulling up one water molecule here in the leaf the entire water column will get pulled up the xylem and it is a continuous column so the pull is exerted all the way through the root and from the soil the water is pulled into the root system and it passes up the xylem in the form of a continuous column that's why we call this as the transpiration stream and this theory as the transpiration pull theory okay so imagine this is the plant and this is the leaf and this is the root so what is extending throughout xylem is extending throughout in the form of a tube this is the xylem and this is the leaf now in the leaf if you were to see what kind of if you were to take a section of this in the leaf you will see that this is the xylem let me show the xylem in the form of a tube okay then surrounding the xylem very close to the xylem you have these irregular shaped cells these irregular shaped cells are called the mesophyll cells and then somewhere here you will find the stomata in the lower surface of the leaf and this chamber above the stomata is referred to as the stomatal chamber now let me take three cells here cell a cell b and cell c and now the water has come all the way down from below the water is moving in the xylem in the form of a continuous chain so this is the water and what are the forces that are holding the water molecule together the forces are the cohesion forces all the way from the root so this is the xylem it has come to the leaf now okay water is also forming a continuous column with respect to it forms a continuous sheath or a covering or a layer in all the cells also now imagine the water is evaporating here into the stomatal substomatal chamber when the water evaporates from this particular cell the water potential of this cell will decrease compared to the neighboring cell b so water will flow from b to a now when water flows from b to a the water potential of b will decrease and now water will flow from c to b so similarly water is dragged out of the xylem c will drag the xylem water out and this water that is pulled out the pull is exerted throughout the water column and the entire water column is dragged up the xylem in the form of an unbreakable chain so this is what is the transpiration cohesion tension theory that explains how transpiration happens so evaporation is a most important step here water is evaporating into the substomatal chamber and the cell which is losing the water its water potential will decrease in comparison to the neighboring cell now in the neighboring cell water potential is high so water will flow into so water will flow from c to b over here and from b to a and from a it moves into the substomatal space okay so water from c where is what c taking water from it is taking water from the xylem and that pull that is exerted all the way down the xylem and that is what is responsible for the uh, translocation or the transpiration of water okay now you know the stomatal structures there are two uh, bean shaped cells the inner wall is very very thick and inelastic whereas the outer wall is very thin and elastic and cellulose microfibrils are connecting the outer wall and the inner wall in a radial pattern and when the cell becomes turgid when water enters the cell the outer wall say for example this is the stomata 
now this is the inner wall and this is the outer wall inner wall is very rigid so imagine that water is entering into the stomatal cell so when the water enters it will get turgid when there is turgidity the outer elastic wall and the thin wall will get pulled out and that pull is exerted onto the inner wall and this stretching is exerted onto the inner wall and the inner wall becomes crescent shaped when both the inner walls become crescent shaped then what happens is the stomata opens up and through this stomata the water evaporates during transpiration so it is actually the outer wall the outer elastic wall that actually moves out and the inner wall which is very thick and inelastic is the one that is pulled alongside to form a crescent like structure and how is the pull exerted from the outer wall to the inner wall because between the outer wall and the inner wall there are radially arranged cellulose microfibrils which will help in transferring the pull from outer wall to the inner wall okay now the pressure or the mass flow hypothesis is best explaining how phloem translocates food now i will give a very simple example here so let me take this is the leaf okay and this is the stem and the root so this is the ground surface and you all know that phloem is basically made up of sieve tubes like this so these are the sieve tubes then there is a companion cell attached to it and running very close to the phloem tissue you also have the xylem xylem is carrying water in it so let me draw xylem here and let me show some spiral thickenings onto xylem so that you can easily distinguish the xylem from the phloem so this is the xylem tissue first the food is synthesized in the now here since we are talking about pressure flow or mass flow hypothesis we are talking about the translocation of the food in the phloem okay so the food is synthesized in the leaf and the food gets loaded into the phloem tissue and then the food is loaded into the phloem tissue it is in the form of sucrose molecule so you can imagine when sucrose gets loaded into the phloem sieve tube at the upper part of the stem where near the leaf we call it as the source so at the source where the food is synthesized in the leaf the sucrose the sucrose molecule gets loaded into the sieve tube now you can imagine the water potential of the sieve tube will decrease because it has become heavily concentrated with sucrose but in the xylem the water potential is high comparatively so all the water will undergo osmosis from higher water potential to lower water potential now when here what is happening now here endosmosis is happening why because water is entering from the xylem into the phloem so now what pressure will build up imagine this is the sieve tube and imagine this is the protoplast of the sieve tube now when water is continuously entering inside please all of you remember the concept that the cell wall will start exhibiting the plasma membrane will swell up and it will exert a pressure on the cell wall which is referred to as the turgor pressure isn't it so here the turgor pressure increases there is a very high turgor pressure over here now as you go down what happens is <clears throat> the turgor pressure decreases why because the sucrose molecules are taken up by the surrounding tissue now when the sucrose molecules are taken up by the surrounding tissue for utilization what will happen to the water potential in the sieve tube the water potential will decrease sorry it will increase because you are taking up the sucrose molecule compared to what compared to the xylem whose water potential will now decrease now what will happen water will flow out of 
the surrounding tissue so what will happen to the turgor pressure which we abbreviated as tp the turgor pressure will fall so just above the turgor pressure was very high and below the turgor pressure is low so from higher turgor pressure to lower turgor pressure the sucrose molecules will start flowing so where do they flow they always flow from the higher turgor pressure to lower turgor pressure why do we call this as the sink because here the root cells will take up the sucrose molecules from the phloem sieve tube and when they take up the sucrose molecule what will happen to the water potential inside the phloem the water potential will increase compared to the water potential in the surrounding xylem which has now decreased and therefore all the water will exit from the phloem and therefore the turgor pressure is low so as we move away from the source the turgor pressure decreases so from in which direction to which direction is the sucrose being translocated now sucrose is being translocated from a higher turgor pressure to a lower turgor pressure okay and how do we know that phloem is the one that translocates the food because if you remove a ring of a stem including the phloem the bark along with the phloem if you remove it then we see that the food starts collecting not below the ring but above the ring that means the food is moving in a downward direction and that means the inner central core which is making up the xylem is not responsible for the translocation of the food it is the outer region which is the bark which has secondary phloem in it which is responsible for translocation of food so with this we complete the synopsis of the chapter translocation sorry transport in plants thank you